Well, hello and welcome everyone. Uh, Council Room 2023. My name is Michael Zecca and today I'm going to be doing a little science presentation like I've done at some of the past cons about the history of space telescopes. Now one drawback to pre-recording this panel, which I am doing today on December 25th, 2022, the one year anniversary of the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. One drawback again to doing it pre-recorded is I won't be able to interact with you and answer your questions as we go. That being said, I would be very happy to answer questions if you hit me up on Discord after the panel, or you can leave comments in the YouTube chat, and I'll try to get back to you when I can. I do want to start off by saying that while my original training was in astrophysics, I uh, have drifted away from that over the years, and it's more of a passion and hobby at this point. So there are details I will not have, uh, but I can point you to resources to read online, or you may be, even be able to ask our uh, special guest at the convention, the astrophysicist that's coming. She may be able to answer some of these questions as well. All right. Well, <clears throat> of course, the James Webb Space Telescope has been in the news a lot in the last year, and thought I'd give you a little background on why we put telescopes in space and how we got to this point, and a little bit more of where we're going to go from here. So let's move on to the first uh, slide here. And the first thing I want to talk about is there are basically two main types of optical telescopes. There is the refractor on the left, which is the one with the large lens at one end and the small lens at the other end to focus and magnify the image. And there's the reflector type telescope that came along a little later which uses a parabolic curve mirror to kind of do what the big lens on the refractor telescope is doing, reflects it off another small mirror to a small lens that can focus it into your eye. Now, in the image you see here, the, um, the uh, lens is placed over on the side of the telescope, but on many of these space telescopes, you'll actually see the hole in the mirror down here with the light coming through to various detectors, cameras, and so forth. And of course, this is just a humorous little uh, XKCD cartoon comparing the two types of telescopes. And of course, one of the drawbacks of the reflector is that we can't see space vampires. Okay, but drawbacks of the refractor, although it was the first type of telescope developed, they are more expensive to build. They're less compact, and by that we mean that the bigger that that front lens gets and the more magnification we want, the longer the tube has to get. And that very quickly becomes something too large to launch into space. Um, they also have some other uh, drawbacks when it comes to color and light gathering, where the reflectors are able to see dim objects quite well. All right, well, moving on. Let's again talk about why we would want to put a telescope in space. We've had telescopes looking at things from the ground for many, many years. In the early days, astronomers sketched what they saw, described what they saw. In the past century and a half, we've been using photographic plates and film and other kinds of detectors to see the light. Well, there are many kinds of light. This is the entire electromagnetic spectrum here. And as you can see, the visible light is a very narrow band, what we can see with our eyes. On this chart, to the left is light that's hotter, more energetic than blue light. The wavelengths are much shorter. The frequencies are much higher. To the right, you're looking at light that's colder than red light. It's got longer wavelengths. It doesn't come to your eyes as fast, so it's not, it's not as frequent. Well, not fast isn't the word, but not as frequent. Um, so again, in, in, when you get beyond the blue, on the left, you have energetic light like ultraviolet light, x-rays, gamma rays. And as you can see, the atmosphere does a very good job of blocking most of that from getting to us from space. And that's really a good thing because this kind of light could be very harmful to human beings, as we know, because some of the ultraviolet light does get through and we get sunburns. And some of us get much more sunburn than others, let me tell you. Um, so if we wanted to actually see things in space that are emitting that kind of light, we really need to get the telescope up above the atmosphere in order to be able to detect that light. 
are there things that create these uh, very high energy uh, forms of light? Absolutely. Um, obviously, we know that there's ultraviolet light that comes from the sun. It's not the primary brightest light coming from the sun's atmosphere, but it's definitely something we see. But we have detected X-rays from black holes. We've detected gamma rays from collisions of black holes or collisions of neutron stars. So these are definitely things we try to look for in the universe. Likewise, when we go colder than red, uh, if you think about a flame, the blue part of the flame is closest to the wick and the red's on the outside, right? It's hotter, closer to the wick. But if you put your hand near that red part of the flame on the outside, you're still going to feel heat. And that heat is actually infrared light. Our bodies are only able to see certain colors with our eyes, but we're able to actually sort of see, detect that infrared light using sensors in our skin. So, um, as you can see, some of the infrared light starts to penetrate into the atmosphere. Some of that heat gets into the atmosphere, but the atmosphere does absorb it. So if we want to see things in the infrared, we need to get up to a high altitude. In some cases, we are able to do this with airplanes, uh, telescopes and airplanes. In some cases, we use rockets. And in some cases, we need a telescope in space. And as you get deeper into the infrared, the atmosphere does a very good job of blocking it. So we really do need that space telescope. But then when we get into the radio band, and yes, radio waves are a form of light. So we get into the radio wave band, that is something we can see from Earth. So we have a lot of radio telescopes on Earth, and we haven't gone out of our way to put a lot of radio observatories in space because it's very easy to set up an antenna on the ground to do this. But when you get into the deep past the radio, we start calling those microwaves. When we get into those really long wavelengths, again, the atmosphere blocks things, and we want to put space observatories up to look for that sort of thing. Now, another reason why we might want to look at some of these different lights, again, it has to do with energy. It has to do with temperature. The um, temperature of an object sort of dictates what its peak color is broadcasting it is. If you look at the sun, the sun is, we think of it as a yellow star. It's actually more of a greenish yellow star. And this is why the center of our visible spectrum is in the green. This is the light that is coming most off of the sun, brightest off of the sun. But if you look at other stars, a star like Betelgeuse, which is a little cooler, a star like Proxima Centauri, which is a little cooler, you're going to see a primarily red color. If you look at a hotter, younger star, you might see primarily a blue color. Where do planets fit in? As it turns out, planets are brightest in the infrared because they are radiating what we think of as heat. It's a much colder temperature than what you would see on the surface of the sun. But each planet does emit some energy from its surface that we can see, and we can see them brighter in the infrared. So that is a reason why we make so many of these observatories as well. Now you will notice here with the visible light, some of the visible light is absorbed by the atmosphere. Not a lot, but some. And that does create some distortion. Also with the way wind is moving and the way the atmosphere is churning with weather and all, you get some distortion. So another reason to put a telescope into space is that you can get a crisp, clear image of things that are outside the Earth's atmosphere. All right, well, let's move on here. In 1946, we took our very first picture from space. After World War II, there were many German rocket scientists that were recruited by the U.S. There were many that were recruited by Russia as well. And uh, so Werner von Braun and his team put together a V-2 rocket left over from the war strapped a camera to it and launched it straight up into space. It reached an altitude of 105 kilometers, about 65 miles. We're just creeping into space there. This is where our weather balloons go. This is where rockets still go to this day. And at the peak of its climb, so the rocket kind of goes straight up and at the peak of its climb, it's got a few minutes there where it's able to take a picture. And this was our very first picture taken from space of the Earth in 1946. To this day, there are graduate students at universities across the world, especially across the U.S., that build 
rockets with small telescopes or other detectors on board. It's a very inexpensive way compared to some of the space telescopes we're going to talk about later on to get some data. Um, there were graduate students at my university, the University of Colorado, that did this. They would build chemical rockets, take them down to New Mexico, launch them, get 10 minutes of data, come back, process that data. That still goes on today. But when did we start putting permanent telescopes in space? A little bit later on. Let's talk a little bit more about the why before we move on. Again, here's a nice little image of the wavelengths. And as you see, there are some wavelengths like the gamma rays that sort of get absorbed as they come into the upper atmosphere. So we would need to get up in the, you know, almost to the depths of space to see things. Whereas the visible light can reach, you know, down below. If you put a telescope up on a mountain, you can get around some of the distortion and some of the absorption, but it's still not quite as crisp as in space. You can put a telescope on an airplane to pick up some of that infrared light or to get above some of that distortion. And we've done that. There's a Sophia Observatory about to retire from NASA. It's a 747 airplane that's been modified to carry a large telescope. And then we've got the radio waves that we can very easily pick up on the ground. But up here, this is where we want to go. We want to go up here above the absorption, above the Earth's atmosphere to see what's going on. Okay, so the 60s and early 70s are kind of the dawn of space telescopes. At the same time that we were starting to send manned missions into space, starting to launch satellites, starting to even send our first probes to other planets, we also did put small telescopes in orbit. There were a lot of technological limitations. Computers were very analog at the time, so most of these are controlled from the ground. So you have to have them close enough that there's not a real long delay as you're manipulating the telescope and so on. And as you can see, most of the focus was on forms of light that we cannot see from the ground. Gamma rays, the United States had an observatory, the uh, European Space Agency had an observatory, the Soviets had several. Uh, the X-ray observatory, same thing. You can see the Netherlands and India were even involved in this. Even in the 1960s and early 70s, there were many ultraviolet uh, experiments done. There were particle detectors launched by the Soviets to detect cosmic rays and energetic electrons from the sun. And we even did have a visible light telescope and one that could look at the sun. Um, you may notice that some of these are labeled one, two, four, or two and three, but where's number one? Again, this is the early days of space travel, and we weren't always making things well. And so OA01 was one of the first observatories launched by the United States, and it failed once it reached orbit. The Soviets lost the Proton-3, etc. That first visible light telescope we're talking about that also did some ultraviolet, that ATM, that was the Apollo telescope module. This was originally designed to be an Apollo mission that did not go to the moon, but instead carried a variety of telescopes on board to do observations in space. And the mission was modified. It was actually ended up being attached to the Skylab space station and did some work there. And in fact, I want to talk a little bit about two of these missions just so we get a sense of what was going on back there. So first there was OA02, which was like the first successful U.S. observatory in space. And it had a variety of smallish telescopes. When I say smallish, they went up to 16 inches in diameter for that mirror, which is a pretty good size if you're an amateur, but it's pretty common at university observatories. So it's not a huge telescope. You know, at the same time, we had professional observatories on the ground in the visible light over 100 inches in diameter. And here we're just launching 12 to 16 inch scopes, feeding them into UV detectors and being able to see into several bands of UV light. This was launched in December 1968, went up about almost 500 miles from the Earth, which is not real far in space terms, but it's, it's a higher orbit. And you can see it had a mass of about two tons. And there's a picture there, so you can see, get a sense of what this looked like. Um, and then that Apollo module, again, that we talked about on Skylab, this actually took 150,000 photographs in the year or so it was in operation. But these were all taken by astronauts on the ship. 
This was one that was not controlled in the ground, but it still had to be controlled manually by a human being. Um, more interesting to me is that it, they used film cartridges and the, to access the film cartridges and to change them out, the astronauts had to do spacewalks periodically. So there's a certain danger involved even just changing the film and the cameras on this thing. But it did have a variety of scopes. It did do some X-ray and ultraviolet work. It did have visible light scopes. And it had some hydrogen alpha filters to do really detailed solar observations. Okay, well, um, so as you can see, we've done a lot of astronomy here in the 60s and 70s with space telescopes. We're getting to know what we're doing. As we went into the late 70s and beyond, we planned for newer versions of these telescopes that could do more. So there were more telescopes going up, launched by NASA, launched by the Soviets, launched by the ESA. And there's a few in particular I want to talk about that were very crucial in like my high school and university years there in the 80s and into the early 90s. So first off, let's talk about the dawn of infrared astronomy in space. So our infrared astronomy period, as I said before, most of that infrared light, which is, could be coming from things like planets, dust clouds, and so on, was getting absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere. So in order to be able to see in those wavelengths, we needed to get a telescope up into space. So in January 1983, we launched the Infrared Astron Astronomical Satellite. This was a IRAS. This was a collaboration between the United States, the European Space Agency, the Netherlands, creating various instruments for the spacecraft. It, went, it was orbiting at about 550 miles around the Earth, so very similar to some of the other telescopes we saw. But the key thing was in order to be able to see that deep space heat, the telescope itself had to be cooled to incredibly cold temperatures. This telescope had an operating temperature of 2 Kelvin. That's 2 degrees above absolute zero. Uh, in order to do that, we had to keep a supply of extremely cold superfluid helium to run over the detectors. Well, you started with 73 kilograms of that in January of 1983. But over time, that helium evaporates as heat from the surroundings hit it. And so we had to keep using it. And so this had a very short lifespan because of the onboard supply of helium. This telescope weighed about a ton, but in, in it, 10 months that it operated, before it ran out of helium, it was able to do a full sky survey. It cataloged over 250,000 distinct infrared sources. Some of those were dust clouds. Some of those were objects in our own solar system. Two key discoveries. We looked at the star Vega, which is a relatively nearby, relatively young star. And we saw this disk around the star, which suggested the formation of a planetary system. You got to remember 1983, while we believed there were planets in other solar systems, we had no proof. We'd never identified a single one. In recent years, we've discovered thousands through mainly indirect methods. But in 1983, this was huge. We also did the first images of the core of the Milky Way. There's a lot of dust obscuring what's at the center of our galaxy. And by looking in the infrared light, we could see through some of that dust to what was lying behind. So again, this is our first big infrared observatory. Have we had more since? Absolutely. We have had successors to IRAS, but IRAS kind of kicked things off. All right, well, another big telescope from those formative years of mine was the International Ultraviolet Explorer, which is an 18 inch telescope that was a reflector telescope with a sensitivity in the ultraviolet. So this is a more advanced ultraviolet telescope than the ones we'd seen before. It was launched in 1978. It was expected to last three years. That's what it was designed for. But we try to design these things better if we can and get more time and more data with them if we can. And this telescope actually operated for 18 years before funding was cut by Newt Gingrich's Congress. <laughs> so think about this. This telescope was still operational at 18 years, still collecting good data, and it was shut down just because of funding. Now, this was orbiting at a much higher altitude. 
We actually pushed it a little further from the Earth and ran it in a geosynchronous orbit, which is about 22,000 miles out. That's quite a lot higher than the telescopes we've uh, had in space prior to this, the satellites we've had in space prior to this. I mean, we've put weather satellites and things in this uh, kind of orbit as well. But yeah, and so it's a little bit longer to get a transmission to and from it. You're talking a few seconds back and forth. But uh, this was the first space observatory really operated in real time by astronomers from ground stations in the U.S. and Europe. And it was actually operated from multiple locations. Um, in the United States, the primary control station for this spacecraft was at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Washington, D.C. But by the time I was at the University of Colorado, we had a secondary station there at the university because so many astronomers at that university and in the western United States were using this spacecraft that it just made sense to have another control station there so people wouldn't have to fly to DC to run it. Um, another beautiful thing about this telescope running as long as it did, um, there's a lot of competition to get time to use these telescopes to do observations for your scientific research. When you have a brand spanking new telescope like this, it's going to be professors at universities who have really cool projects in mind, a lot of grant money in mind, that are going to get time on this. 18 years out, there were a lot of graduate students getting time on this telescope that were able to do some incredible research on their own um, dissertations. So, yeah, it is, this one actually became really versatile and useful for a lot of uh, up-and-coming scientists later in its life. Um, so some of the key observations from International Ultraviolet Explorer were the first large-scale studies of stellar winds. That's like solar winds, but coming off of other stars. I also did some accurate measurements of interstellar dust and the light absorbed by it. And a world kicker for me, in 1987, there was a supernova in a nearby galaxy called that we've named SN1987A. And using the International Ultraviolet Explorer and other instruments um, like the Hubble Space Telescope later on, we've been able to watch in the subsequent days, months, years, what happens after a supernova in a star system and in the surrounding area around it, how other stars may start to form out of dust clouds because of it, and so on. So this, this was pretty cool. This is pretty cool. Were there other ultraviolet uh, telescopes? Yeah, absolutely, and there have been more since. The Spitzer Observatory, I believe, is another one that's come along since. Another big one from the 80s that's had follow-ups as well was the Cosmic Background Explorer. Now, this one was in those extremely cold microwaves it was looking for, so colder than infrared. What the Cosmic Background Explorer was really looking for was the background radiation of the universe left over from the Big Bang. So we believe the universe was created in a large explosion 13 or so billion years ago, and over time the universe has expanded and that energy has been distributed across this much wider space, and so it has cooled. In some cases it has clumped together to form stars and galaxies and so forth, but there's a general glow all over everything that when we look at it in microwave radiation, we see it at a temperature of about 2.7 Kelvin as the temperature today. What was cool with this Explorer is we not only saw that, but you can see the subtle variations across the universe with this. And you'll see these maps with different colors, and you can see there were subsequent missions like the Wilson and the Planck Surveyor that saw in greater detail. And you see these gradations in that heat where it's a little more warm in some places and a little less in other places, like we have matter starting to clump together. But these variations we're seeing are actually in tiny fractions of a degree. Uh, what the Background Explorer and its relatives have really done is to support the theory that the universe as a whole is generally pretty smooth. So again, huge discovery for its time. Okay, so that kind of got us through the 80s, and now we're approaching the 90s, and there had been a telescope in development since the 1960s. The scopes we've had up till now have been 12-inch, 16-inch, 18-inch telescopes that we've been mounting on a rocket and sending into space. This is the kind of telescope you would have at a university, not at a large observatory. 
we wanted a large observatory in space, something where we could see with a lot of magnification, see deep into the universe, see great detail on things in the outer solar system. And in 1990, we were finally able to launch this telescope. So you've probably heard of it, the Hubble Space Telescope, named by Edwin J. Hubble, who is the astrophysicist who discovered that the universe was expanding in size. This idea of the Big Bang Theory came from his observations back in the 1930s. The Hubble Space Telescope is roughly the size of a school bus and was designed to fit into the bay of a space shuttle. So we were utilizing new launch techniques in order to be able to move a larger telescope into space. We didn't really do much with big rockets at this point to move large objects into space. We used the space shuttle to bring it up there. So this orbited about 300 miles above the Earth's surface. It's a little higher than the shuttle would normally fly when it was just doing a basic satellite mission or observation mission. But with just a little extra fuel, it can just pop up to that higher altitude and pop the space or pop this out of the bay, which is how it was launched. The Hubble Space Telescope was designed to see very well in visible light, just like a ground observatory. So this is our first big visible light observatory in space. But it also saw a little bit into the infrared and into the near infrared. So it did have the ability to run things through detectors and see some of this ultraviolet light and some of this infrared light. It has a long tube that's to keep sunlight out and keep the heat out so that you don't have to use as much helium to keep those mirrors cool, to keep those detectors cool, to see the infrared. Uh, this mission was expected to last at least 15 years. It has actually gone for more than 30. Uh, we famously have had several repair missions. Of course, the most famous one being the contact lens. Uh, unfortunately, there were some uh, errors or some settling under gravity before this was able to launch. And so the uh, primary curve mirror and that first uh, mirror that reflects the light back to the detectors were slightly out of alignment with each other. Now, if you listened as I did on April 24th, 1990, to local news broadcasters, it sounded like this was done so badly that a $50 department store telescope would see better in space, and that was not the case at all. It actually saw quite well. This was more like you wore last year's glasses. It's just slightly blurry, not as crisp as you want it to be. So they were actually able to do some experiments with the Hubble Space Telescope while upgrading their repair mission. But the first repair mission, the space shuttle astronauts were able to go up and basically insert a contact lens to correct for this error and fix the vision on Hubble to keep it crisp. Over the years since, they were able to upgrade computer systems, and upgrade other detectors and things on board, and generally make it a more advanced spacecraft. Um, you can see the operating temperature is like room temperature. By keeping that tube cool, you're able to keep it, you know, reasonable for doing things. It's a big baby. I mean, you know, we talked about some of these other telescopes being a ton or two. This was an 11-ton telescope. So again, size of a school bus. Big. But it's been beautiful. It's done lots of good for us over the years. You've seen plenty of Hubble pictures. I'm not going to show them all to you here today. You get the idea, though. Before we move on and talk about other large observatories, I do want to talk about far observatories. We've talked about the New Horizons spacecraft at some of my past panels. It's launched in 2006, flew by Jupiter in 2007, flew by Pluto in 2015, and by a Kuiper Belt object called Arakoth in 2019. And on board the, this New Horizons spacecraft, there are some small telescopes. The LORI telescope is an 8.2 inch reflector with a one megapixel CCD camera. Now, you might be laughing at one megapixel now, but in 2006, a megapixel was a decent digital camera. And CCD is the sort of digital cameras we were using in astronomy prior to the invention of the CMOS cameras that you have in your cell phone today. The idea is that light hits a little detector, which creates an electrical current, and the amount of current is related to how bright the light is and the frequency of that light, so you know, or the wavelength of that light. And so you can use these detectors to form a digital image of things in the distance. Um, the reason New Horizons has this 8-inch telescope was on board is mainly to scout ahead. So they're able to look ahead and make sure that Pluto was still in range. 
that Air, they start to get some sense of what Arakoth was going to look like before they got there. Even though we'd taken some pictures of this thing, these things with the Hubble Space Telescope, the Earth is so far away from them that we weren't seeing much detail. And even with this smaller telescope, because the spacecraft was much closer to the objects, it was able to start getting better pictures than we got on the ground. It's also being used to scout ahead to see if there are other objects out there in the Kuiper Belt that the spacecraft could visit that uh, we couldn't know about from the ground otherwise. So it's a very useful instrument. Now I say it's fixed. It's actually just built into the spacecraft. In order to steer the telescope, you have to just steer the whole spacecraft, turn it to see ahead in a different direction. Meanwhile, there's another small telescope on board called the Ralph Telescope, which is only about three inches. Um, it's, it has a nice visible light CCD camera and a near-infrared imaging spectrometer that was used to look at details on Pluto and details on Arakoth during the flybys. Um, it's also paired with another instrument called ALICE. These uh, two instruments were named after characters from the Honeymooners. Uh, astrophysicists like their acronyms and their fun names for things. So, yeah. All right. Well, we have had, we've talked a lot about the Hubble Space Telescope over the years. We know what it's doing. And it has a successor up there now that's been all over the news, the James Webb Space Telescope. But let's talk for a minute about James Webb, who it's named for. He's kind of the elephant in the room here. Uh, James Webb was the 16th Undersecretary of State and did a lot of work with Lyndon Johnson back then. He later was, uh, with Johnson's uh, urging, uh, Kennedy appointed him as the second administrator of NASA. And he saw NASA through Kennedy and LBJ's administration from 61 to 68, uh, resigning shortly before Richard Nixon took over uh, office of the presidency so that he could appoint his own NASA administrator. He oversaw NASA through the Mercury and Gemini programs. He also saw through the early days of Apollo, including the Apollo 1 fire. Um, a real positive of James Webb, when he came into NASA, it was the worst government agency of all the federal government agencies when it came to racial integration, ethnic diversity in the workforce, in management, and so on. By 1968, he'd turned it into the best department in government when it came to racial integration. However, there was also a period in the 50s and 60s known as the Lavender Scare. You've heard of the Red Scare with communists under every bedpost, but the Lavender Scare was unfortunately a time when LGBTQ employees of the government were being drummed out. And there was very famously a rather high-ranking engineer at NASA that was fired during James Webb's tenure. And when the telescope was about to be launched, there were groups that were concerned about naming a telescope after someone who may have done things like this. There were investigations. Uh, the suggestion is that Webb himself may not have been responsible really for outing this person and leading to his firing, that it was actually one of his deputies that did most of this work and pushed for it. Webb's own involvement in things still remains a little bit vague. So the controversy's there. I'm going to acknowledge it. I'm just going to refer to the scope as JWST, just as we refer to Hubble as HST from here on out, just so we can be comfortable with talking about this telescope. So the, the JWST has a mirror that is 6.5 meters in diameter. That's about 2.7 times larger than HST. That's similar to some of the larger telescopes we have on the Earth now. There are larger, there's an 8 meter telescope in Hawaii, there's a 10 meter telescope in South America. And when we get to this size on the Earth, we have to break up those large mirrors into lots of small mirrors that together form a large mirror because otherwise they would collapse under their own gravity. And it was created like this for JWST, both because the thing had to be made here on Earth, and so gravity was still concerned. We didn't want the mirror breaking prior to launch, but also because this mirror is so large, it would not fit full size into any rocket that exists currently. We had to be able to fold it into thirds. So that mirror started out folded into thirds. Uh, you can see there's sun shields and things below the mirror that also were all folded up. It was packed up tight into the top of the largest rocket 
that the European Space Agency makes. NASA doesn't even have a rocket big enough, or didn't at the time, to launch this. So this was launched a year ago um, today from when I'm recording this, December 25th, 2021, from an ESA Ariane 5 rocket in, I believe, Guyana. And it has an expected mission of lifetime of five years, but we're, ex we're really hoping to get at least 20 years out of this telescope. Um, it can see partially into the visual spectrum. It kind of sees oranges and reds, but it goes into those same infrared wavelengths that uh, Hubble could see, but better. With a much larger mirror, it can see deeper into the past. It can see deeper into the distant universe. It can magnify closer objects more. Um, it's not the first spacecraft to be put here, but it's one of a few that has been actually placed at a Lagrange point. And we'll talk a little bit more about Lagrange points in a moment, but this, this Lagrange point is about a million and a half kilometers from Earth or a little under a million miles from Earth. And when you're talking these distances, like with Hubble, we're not necessarily doing all the control from the ground anymore. We want the computers to be able to handle a certain amount on their own. We'll send orders to it. We want to look at this object for this long at this time, but we don't have to be steering it with a joystick necessarily. Um, key thing is, because we want to see well in the infrared, we want to get this telescope cold. We don't want to have to shove a bunch of helium in there like we did with the IRES satellite and have it evaporate over time. So instead, these elaborate sun shields were created underneath the telescope. And this telescope is out almost a million miles from the Earth on the far side of the Earth from the sun with the sun shields always facing towards the sun. So the telescope is perpetually in dark. This is good both because you're not getting any interference from the sun in your observations or the Earth, but also because it keeps the telescope cold. When you're this far from the Earth, space is very cold. And by blocking the sunlight, you don't get that heat. So we can get the temperature of the telescope mirror down to about 45 kelvins or 45 degrees above absolute zero, which is far colder than you ever see in Minnesota, of course. Um, Payload mass, it's actually about half of Hubble. It's a fairly lightweight uh, spacecraft in some ways compared to Hubble because a lot of this is just this thin mylar sheeting or whatever this is that they're using as a sun shield. Okay, so this scope is much larger than Hubble, which means we can see more detail. We can see further into the past, further into the distance. So what are we seeing? What are we going to be seeing? come to that in a moment. I want to give you one more sense of how large this telescope is. Hubble was about the size of a school bus. JWST with its sun shield is about the size of a tennis court. And the mirror itself is probably about the size of one of the smaller uh, panel rooms at console room. And this picture here is of a bunch of the people that worked on this telescope with a mock-up of the telescope. All right, now let's talk Lagrange points real quick. So again, when we're talking about orbiting it, there are five places in, when you have two large gravitational objects, massive objects like the sun and the earth, you've got five places in orbit around them that have some relative stability in terms of energy, in terms of gravitational attraction and repulsion. And when it's like this, you've got some things canceling out so you don't have to use quite as much fuel to keep the uh, object in that orbit successfully. So there are five points, L1, L2, L3, L4, and L5. L3 is far away around the other side of the sun. We've talked about putting space probes there, but it's a long distance to go to. L1 is closer to the sun than the Earth, and it's where the SOHO Solar Observ Observatory is. It's a great place to look at the sun because you have an unobstructed view of it at all times. The Earth and the moon are not in the way. We don't want that for JWST. We want it in a cold place, so we put it behind the Earth in that L2 position. Now, those L4 and L5 positions on the sides are extremely stable points in the orbit of the Earth around the sun, but it's one of those places that asteroids and dust like to hang out. So we're staying away from there for now. Okay, so... What can this telescope do? What are we going to be seeing? We've had six months to look at pictures so far. There's going to be a lot more pictures and data coming in for a lot more years with this scope. But let's get a sense of what it's capable of 
based on some of the things we've seen so far. This is Titan. Titan is the largest moon of Saturn. It is also unique in the solar system as having a methane cycle very similar to Earth's water cycle. The natural gas, methane, exists both in solid form, liquid form, and gaseous form on Titan. It has an atmosphere made primarily of methane. It has lakes made of methane. It has rain made of methane. It has ice caps made of methane. And from the Keck Observatory in Hawaii, which is up high on a volcano, they've been able to do some infrared observations to look at clouds on Titan and to see through the atmospheric haze. But we also were able to do that with the James Webb Telescope. So these are two pictures taken two days apart, one with Webb, one with Keck. So we can see details on moons in the outer solar system. Likewise, we can look at distant planets. So on the far left, we have a picture taken of Neptune by Voyager 2 when it was up close in 1989. The picture in the middle is taken by the Hubble Space Telescope just last year and, again, taken from near-Earth orbit. And you can see not as good a detail as you do with the Voyager, but you can see quite a bit from the ground. But what you're not seeing easily are the moons and the rings. Now, the moons of uh, Neptune have been discovered various ways over the years, but the rings are really quite interesting. We didn't discover the rings of Neptune until we were a few years away with Voyager, and they were only detected kind of indirectly, and they didn't look like complete rings. They looked clumpy, like arcs. But as we got close with Voyager and we took some longer exposures, we did see these long, arcy rings that were clumpy in places, but they were complete rings with moons embedded in, like we see with Saturn. What's interesting is when you look in just the infrared, look at how bright Neptune is from the ground. Look at how easily you can see the rings from a near-Earth orbit. You can see quite a bit of detail of moons and rings around Neptune and in the atmosphere of Neptune with infrared light from all this distance away in the outer solar system. So pretty cool. So we're going to be able to use Webb to study the moons and rings of the outer solar system, we'd probably be able to explore the Kuiper Belt more, find other objects like Pluto that are out there. There's a certain amount of speculation that there may be another large planet out there we haven't detected yet. There's orbital reasons why people think this. Maybe this would help in that search. Who knows? But here's another thing. We talked about planets outside the solar system. Again, when... IRAS pointed at Vega, we saw the first evidence probably of a planetary system forming of planets outside the solar system. In the subsequent decades, we've had many indirect methods for discovering planets around other stars, mainly looking at how gravity makes the star wobble uh, because a large planet can make the you know, orbit of the star wobble around a little bit. Uh, we've also done indirect methods where we see light from a large planet, uh, or well, not light from a large planet, but as a large planet moves in front of a star, watching the light dip and come back up. But in a few rare cases, we've managed to directly observe exoplanets now. And JWST has already done this. So these are pictures taken at different infrared frequencies of a nearby star. And this is the star as it looks against its background stars and galaxies. I think taken with Hubble based on the picture I'm seeing there or some other sky survey. But with the zooms in here, the, the star has basically been blocked out and we're looking in the infrared at this large planet forming around the star. And we plan on doing this with a lot more star systems over time. Okay, so we've talked about planets in our own solar system, planets outside our solar system. What else do we want to see? Well, we can go a little further. We can look at Regions of star formation. This is the very famous Pillars of Creation in the Eagle Nebula. The photo on the left was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope in 1995, and you can see an incredible amount of, amount of detail of dust, early forming stars, and so on in this nebula. And on the right, with JWST, we look a little deeper into the infrared, and we can look through some of that dust and see the many stars and galaxies behind so two different images taken by two different telescopes with different levels of detail. Another thing I just thought I'd point out real quick. On the Hubble Space Telescope pictures, you'll often notice that bright stars will have four of these diffraction spikes coming out. 
And these are kind of created because of the placement of that smaller mirror in relation to the larger mirror. And you've got a round mirror that creates a four uh, prong spike. With JWST, you're always going to see six prongs, and it has to do with those hexagonal mirrors and the hexagonal shape to the little mirror and so forth. Okay. HST, JWST, there's, this is again a nebula in our own galaxy, but a bit further away, watching stars forming, star systems forming. All right. Now, what about beyond the galaxy? Absolutely. We can look beyond the galaxy with JWST. In the nearest uh, companion galaxy, the Large Magellanic Cloud, there's a very famous dense star cluster known as the Tarantula Nebula that has been photographed by many telescopes for many years. And on the left, we have a picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope in 2014, which I've rotated into rather the same orientation. And you can see these dust clouds around a bright star and some other stars forming back here. But with JWST, look at how much more magnified the image is. Look at how we're seeing through the dust to the things behind, seeing a lot more of those forming stars, distant galaxies, different distant stars, and so on. Now, something I wanted to point out here is why are the colors different? Remember that Hubble sees visible light pretty well, and a little bit in the infrared and a little bit into the ultraviolet. The Webb telescope is mainly seeing in the infrared. Those are colors our eyes can't see. So when we create a picture, we really kind of map different infrared colors to colors that we can see. So orange in this picture might correspond to a color darker than red. And another color behind it might be darker still. And so these colors technically are false colors in many cases. When we talk about false colors in astron astronomical images, sometimes we have to fudge the colors to be able to see the details. As long as we know what those colors correspond to, though, it can still tell the astrophysicist quite a bit about what they're seeing. All right, well, we can see well beyond a nearby galaxy. But in order to do that, I want to talk a little bit about the distant universe. As we said, Hubble discovered that the universe is expanding and has been since this Big Bang. And when we talk about distant objects, we talk about Doppler redshift quite a bit. And I want you to understand what that is and why that's important. So you've heard this with your ears with sound waves. When an ambulance is approaching you, the pitch gets higher, the frequency gets higher, the waves are getting squished closer together to a higher frequency. When you, and the, and the wavelengths are shorter. When the ambulance is driving away from you, you hear that pitch or that frequency drop as those wavelengths get stretched. When we look at light in the distant universe, we see that this light has been shifted well into the red as well because the distant universe is moving away from us very fast. In fact, most objects we look at in the universe, there is some measure of red shift and not blue shift. Blue would be something coming towards you. And it's only some very close objects that we really notice that coming towards us because even things far away from us that are trying to move toward us, the whole universe itself is expanding. So it's moving away. The thing is, most things in the universe are stars and gas clouds made primarily of hydrogen. We know the hydrogen atom extremely well. We know that when you shine light on a hydrogen atom, it excites the electrons. And when those electrons get excited, they can spit light out. And they spit light out as they move between electron shells, it's basic chemistry. They spit that light out in specific frequencies of light, depending on which shells they're jumping between. So there's a pattern when you see hydrogen lines in light. Hydrogen creates a pattern in the light that you see. You can see that same pattern and how it's shifted in objects that are further away. And you can measure that shift, and that's the redshift. We use that redshift to give us a sense of how fast the object's moving away from us, which when we're talking about the distance universe is really a good way of measuring the distance it is from us. Okay? So here's a picture from the JWST with a bunch of distant galaxies. Everything you see in that picture 
except for up in uh, there's a few there's a few bright stars in there, but pretty much everything you're seeing in that picture is a distant galaxy. Okay, and some of them are even stretched out and distorted because there is actually some sort of dense object in between that is creating a gravitational lens. So we're actually seeing some things even further away stretched out. In some cases, we're seeing the same galaxy at two different times based on this lensing. But what's beautiful is by looking at the spectra, the, the pattern of the light coming from each of these distant galaxies that we know is made primarily of hydrogen, we can get a sense of just how far away they are. And JWST is already breaking records in how far away it is seeing objects, how much detail it is seeing these objects. We're trying to learn a lot about the early universe, the, the early days after the Big Bang, how the first galaxies formed, how quickly. And they're already breaking down some of what we believed. Um, we had a, a certain expectations of how quickly galaxies would form, and we're seeing things further out than that. So it's raising as many questions as it's answering as often happens in science. So we're going to be seeing a lot of that in coming years, and it's going to alter our theories of how the universe form, of how galaxies form, and so on. All right, there's gonna be a lot of these pictures coming for years, a lot of data coming for years. There's a lot of old data from Hubble out there. How do you see it? Easy. There are two websites you wanna to go to. Hubblesite.org has a repository of what Hubble's been doing for the last 33 years. JWST, likewise, if you go to web.nasa.gov, they have a Flickr page full of images of what's already been taken so far. There is even a Twitter account you can track what JWST is pointing at right now. We may not get the data and the pictures from that for weeks, but you can see what it's actually actively working on, which is pretty cool. So if you want to keep tabs on these two telescopes, there you go. All right. Well, this is great. We're going to have... HST still taking data for years. We're going to have JWST taking data for years. We're going to learn a lot more about the early universe and even about the outer solar system. But what's on the drawing board? Lots of telescopes. There's still a lot of smaller telescopes being developed by ESA and India and, and the United Arab Emirates and everyone else under the sun here now. More and more countries are getting involved in space. The United States does have a big telescope on the drawing board, actually in, in construction, planned to go up in a few years. And it's basically going to be the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. Because as we know, it's more than 30 years old. It's not going to last forever. So what we are planning is the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. Similar size to Hubble. Pretty similar spectrum to Hubble. Again, it's mainly geared toward the visible light and a little bit into the near-infrared. This is planned to launch in late 2026 or early 2027 on a SpaceX Falcon Heavy which is one of the largest rockets that SpaceX produces. It has an expected mission lifetime of about five to 10 years. Just like Hubble, it might last a lot longer. Unlike Hubble, we can't do service missions. We can't do those with Hubble anymore anyway, because we don't have space shuttles anymore. But Nancy Grace Roman is gonna be placed out in that Lagrange II position, similar to JWST. It's gonna be its neighbor. So too far away for us to do service missions. So we gotta make sure we do it right the first time out. Nancy Grace Roman was the first chief of astronomy at NASA. She's often considered the mother of the Hubble Space Telescope. She's one of the uh, forces that got that scope off the ground. And so the scope has been named in her honor. You've got a picture of what it's supposed to look like. And again, it's a tube like Hubble with solar panels to keep it powered. And what is it planning on doing? A couple of the key mission objectives. We've got a sky survey of a billion galaxies using a wide field instrument that will give you a wider field of view than the Hubble Space Telescope's infrared instrument. Um, they also really want to use Nancy Grace Roman to do more searching for exoplanets. They want to do some microlensing surveys in the inner Milky Way to look for exoplanets there. They want to use a chronograph instrument to search for and explore the atmospheres of nearby exoplanets. We're at a point where we're starting to look at the spectra of atmospheres of planets outside the solar system to figure out if they have water, if they have oxygen, and so on. Why are we doing this? We're looking for other places in the universe where life might have been able to develop. And so the space telescope is going to succeed Hubble to allow us to continue to do this sort of thing for many years to come. And 
the other big telescope that's still very much early talking stages is this one, the Carl Sagan Observatory. There's a lot of astronomers pushing for this, but funding is still an issue at this point. Also logistics. They want to make a 12 meter telescope. And by in perspective, the largest mirror on an Earth observatory is 10.4 meters. So we're talking, this will be the largest telescope we ever have built in mankind. And we want to put it in space, again, out of that Lagrange point. How do you get it into space? The JWST is half that size and we had to fold it up to fit it inside the largest rocket we have. So there's a lot of questions about how you're going to get it there. Light sensitivity range, it looked like from the notes I was seeing, they're primarily aiming again at that visible light, kind of similar spectrum to HST. They're aiming for maybe a 2034 launch if they can get things together by then. What do they want to do with it? They actually, with such a large telescope, want to be able to try to look at the atmospheres of exoplanets that might be capable of supporting life. Like actually start to see details in the atmospheres. And the imaging resolutions would be far beyond HST and JWST. You'd be able to see features on the surface of Pluto from this observatory. The best Hubble was able to do was a few blotchy pixels. And so this would be a cool thing if it could be built. But can it be and will there be funding for it? A lot of questions there. Obviously, they decided to name it after Carl Sagan because of the focus on exoplanets. Um... Yeah. So I've talked a lot about telescopes in a short amount of time. Talked about some of where we came from. Talked about the Hubble and JWST telescopes that are doing so much good work for us now. And looking ahead to Nancy Grace Roman and Carl Sagan and maybe other telescopes to come. There's so much more we can do to learn about the universe around us. It's easier to do it without the atmosphere of the Earth in the way. So... Thank you, everyone. Uh, hope you enjoy the rest of Console Room 2023.